Tell me when. All right. My name is Mike Bell. I'm state senator, and I am uh, the governor asked me to chair the uh, Asian Carp Advisory Commission. This is the first meeting that we've had uh, for the commission. And uh, what I'd like to do first, instead of calling a roll, I would like to go around to the different commission members, let them introduce themselves, and also say who appointed them and introduce themselves and tell a little bit about themselves. So the members of the public, this is being live streamed uh, and it is being recorded, but so the members of the public will know who is serving on this commission. So what we'll do is we'll start to my left here. If you would, we'll just go, go around to the left and then we'll come back and go to the right. I am Kurt Holbert. I'm the chairman of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission and I am the appointee for the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. My name is Mike Butler. I am the Chief Executive Officer of the Tennessee Wildlife Federation, appointed by Speaker Sexton. Good afternoon. My name is Monty Ballou. I was appointed by the uh, Governor of the State of Tennessee. Uh, work at the University of Tennessee at Martin as the Public Safety Director, and uh, honored to be on this from Henry County. I'm David Salyers. I'm Commissioner of the Tennessee Department of Environment Conservation, and uh, on the committee as uh, as uh, as noted in the executive order good afternoon i am dennis tumlin with the tennessee department of tourist development and i'm representing the tennessee department of tourist development sammy arnold and um here uh, i work for the department of economic and community development and i am our department's designee um, to the to the task force happy to be here Hi, I'm Frank Fizz, Chief of Fisheries for Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency, and I was appointed by Director Bobby Wilson. Frank, thank you. And I believe also via Zoom, we should have um, Bob DC with, uh, with TVA, who was appointed by the governor. Bob, can you hear us? Do we know if Bob has joined us via Zoom? Okay. Well, Bob, we're, we're, we're told you are there. Um, and um, can, can you hear us, Bob? All right, we'll, we'll work on that and, and go on and get back to Bob in just a few minutes. I, I know most of the members of this task force or, or the uh, advisory commission know how this was created, but for the benefit of the public, this uh, advisory commission was created by the governor through executive order and executive order number 62. I'm not going to read all of it, but I do want to uh, read part of it again for the public's benefit. There is hereby established the Asian Carp Advisory Commission formed for the purpose of addressing and mitigating the invasion, the invasion of Asian carp into Tennessee's lakes and river systems in order to protect native fish species, aquatic life, and commercial and recreational fishing and water activities in Tennessee. There, are, there will be 10 members, of which we have introduced one another. The appointed authority shall consider diversity when making appointments to the commission, and the governor shall appoint one of the members to serve as chair of the commission. The governor asked me to serve as chair, and I'm honored uh, that he asked me to do so. Now, what are we supposed to do? The commission first shall deliver an interim report to the governor on or before February 21st, 2021. So we've just got a couple of months to generate a report to give the governor. And we'll, we will be talking about that a little bit later on in this meeting, uh, about what we hope to put together for a report uh, to give the governor at that time. We're supposed to look at the effectiveness of current barriers in place to contain or manage Asian carp, the effectiveness of the Asian carp harvest incentive program, partnerships with nonprofits and private industry with respect to Asian carp management, steps necessary for funding, timing, impl implementing, and locating barriers or other methods to contain or manage Asian carp, and the results of commercial fishing efforts related to Asian carp, and efforts of the Mississippi Interstate Cooperative Resource Association with respect to the management of interjurisdictional fish and other aquatic resources in the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, so we have a pretty big charge. Anybody, especially those of you uh, from West Tennessee, you're more familiar with um, this issue than I am. I've, I've only seen it um, in videos and TV shows. Y'all have experienced it. Now, I've got a son who uh, fished um, 
for a college for several years, and so he's told me about experiencing it personally, but I have yet to see it in person and look forward to maybe at some time being able to take a trip out there with the advisory commission to get a firsthand look at the, um, at the CARP. But that is our charge, and that's what we're supposed to do. I've got a, a, a couple things um, that I would like to see us uh, do today, and then we're going to open it up to any of the members, any recommendations or anything that they would like to add as well. But I'd like to get started first with a presentation uh, by Frank Fiss on TWA's report that they delivered to the governor's office, which was part of this executive order. I think you delivered this back in October, and that uh, we're going to hear a presentation of that report, and then after that we'll open it up for questions that any of the members may have uh, for Frank, and then um, we'll, we'll go on from there for a couple, with a couple other items. So, Frank, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Well, let's see here. So, yes, that report was prepared October 14th, and uh, there's a copy on all your place. I can share that digitally with anybody that needs it. And this presentation is a summary of that document and, and maybe some things that might have happened since. Feel free to ask questions. I'm hoping there's lots of questions. I'm kind of leaving some, uh, shorten it up as much as I can to make time for questions. And hopefully the committee will, will, commission will allow that. So yeah, I've been working on Asian carp for, uh, I guess about 10 years now. And there's been, a, there's been in, when we started, there was very little opportunity to do anything because we didn't have any funding. We didn't have the science that we needed. And we've come a long way and I'll be sharing what, what we've been doing since. Frank, could I interrupt you just sure. a minute? Would you prefer the questions to wait until the end or as they come up as you're speaking? As you please. Okay. Um, my first question to you is, you say you've been working on this about 10 years. When was the first known uh, uh, sighting of Asian carp in Tennessee? In our, in our waterways? Yeah, we, in late 1990s, early 2000s, we were encountering them in decent numbers on the Mississippi River. And, you know, that's our waterway and before we first detected them the the number like when the first the day the first one was seen on say Kentucky Lake I don't have that scribed down anywhere but we we were seeing enough of them that we were able to go out and collect them in some number by say 2012 is when they started to get it get more serious and of course it's been serious ever since uh, that, that that that's about when I can say that happened so what are Asian carp? When you talk about Asian carp nationally, there's four species that come to light and a lot of the federal dollars are targeting all four of these species. Uh, I'm going to talk about mostly about silver and big head carp today, but I'll just mention that grass carp and black carp are a concern. Uh, grass carp we've been stocking in Tennessee for over 50 years since they came into the country for pond uh, weed management and we have had some uh, reproductively viable fish released decades ago. We see them here and there throughout the state. In my opinion, the, the immediate damage that they're going to do has been done, and they're not the, the top priority in our, in our focus. So it's just kind of, I'm kind of setting them aside. They, they could get bad later, but right now they're not knocking on our door. Black carp are the same way. They're in the Mississippi River. They're, they're reproducing there. We've only seen about like less than 10 specimens in Kentucky and Barkley Lakes at this point. And they are a problem because they eat mussels. We have a lot of endangered native mussel species that we're very concerned about. We're just, we just don't have any tools to address that today and they're not as, as so much knocking on the door creating the problems with the other two species. So these are the two species that we're, we're actively working on right now. The silver carp on top is the one that jumps. The one on the bottom is the big head. They don't jump, but they're very similar animals, and they've got a lot similar feeding where they where they are filter feeders. They're not eating fish outright. They're eating the fish that they're eating the phytoplankton that all the fish need to at various stages of their life to to survive. So we're concerned about them stripping the productivity out of the system and leaving nothing left for the species that are native or or other species that we care about. I don't want to be the only one to ask questions, but I've got another question, but I do want to defer to any other member of the commission who may have a question at this point. My, my next question is, these obviously came from an ecosystem where they were not a problem. Uh, what, 
was different about the ecosystem they came from in Asia versus our ecosystem that made, makes them a problem here versus not a problem there? Well, they're, they, the ecosystem that they lived in, in or they still live in in Asia had different other species that they were interacting with in their food web, and we just don't have them here. That's the main thing. And, and incidentally, China was one place where they've overfished these to the point where their, their hatchery production is in the billions of fish that, of these fish that they stock into their waters. We visited those hatcheries, and it's amazing to think that they've got the opposite problem, but that's where, where they're at. They can be overfished at some point. So that's maybe some good news. So let's talk about where they are right now. Now, if you look on the, is my mouse going to drag onto the screen? Yes, it will. Okay. So, of course, I got to look at this one. So on, on West Tennessee, the, these fish are reproducing readily every year, and we have no opportunity to, no tools to control that population. We have abundant Asian carp, or silver and bighead carp in Barkley and, and, and Kentucky Lakes. This is orange area. As you go upstream into Pickwick, there are, there's moderate abundance right now in Pickwick, uh, similar to maybe Cheatham Reservoir, and, and on, say on the Cumberland system in Old Hickory, we have a few, but we've not seen, we get, we've only collected very few in our sampling efforts, and we've ramped that up recently with some extra help that we have, and we'll keep watching that. We've not had any reports up in Cordell Hall Lake. Interesting to note, Cordell Hall Lock is not open very often, so they have little opportunity to get up there. Go on the Tennessee system, the, this, these, uh, the, the little hashes here are dams w that, that are on the river. These red X's are individual observations. So in, 20, in March of 2017, there was a silver carp caught in Wilson, or Wheeler Reservoir, sorry. We've not had a report from Alabama that any more carp have been caught since that point in 2017. We had a big head carp caught during the Bassmaster Classic on Gunnersville this spring. Uh, that's the other fish in hand observation. Get up into Nickajack Reservoir, we've had a, a few dozen fish reported by commercial fishermen. They're probably big head carp, and that's been over the last few years. And we had the one silver carp image reported that to have been, it was taken in October of 2019. And in this past year, we've had the, all, of our, uh, all of our media that we put out to the public says, if you see small fish reproducing, like little carp, let us know, show us, bring them, we want evidence. We have yet to have a small carp to, uh, to be evidence of reproduction anywhere in the Tennessee or Cumberland systems in this calendar year and in the previous five calendar years. 2015 was the, the last time we saw an abundance of small fish in the system. So we're, we're kind of getting a break here in that they are not spawning every year readily and maybe they don't have the conditions they need in some of these systems. If they did have the conditions they needed just anywhere, we would have no hope of controlling this population. But we, we, it gives me hope to know they don't have what they need everywhere they're looking. And you mentioned conditions, and you also have Old Hickory shaded in green. What makes it unlikely for reproduction, and what are the conditions that lead to a low, likely, that, uh, low likeliness of reproduction? It, it, is, uh, it is unlikely that reproduction happened because we didn't detect it. It doesn't mean that they're unlikely to reproduce. That may be a bad name we have on there. We just, they've had opportunity for, we're going on 10 years in the Cumberland system, and we're just not seeing it. So that's, that's, they're not finding what they need and what they need. They're, they need warm water. They get that every summer. They need flows. They need water that's moving enough to carry their eggs enough distance so that they develop out of, out of sediment. They want to be up in, in the water column while they're rolling and, up and oxygenate, being oxygenated and develop. And then they, spawn, then they hatch out of that. Then they have a stage that seeks that slower water on the side channels. And they could have problems finding that part too. There's no doubt that these fish are developing eggs every year. They're probably spawning every year, the act, but they may not have viable uh, offspring, what we call recruiting to the, you know, they don't, they don't make viable young as a process. And they're not the only species like that in Tennessee. We, we stock striped bass everywhere and they don't reproduce because they can't find the conditions they need and they need 
not the same conditions, but they need similar floating, con uh, suspending conditions, and they don't find it everywhere. Sometimes they do, but again, that's, that's the, the, my suspicion would be they would use a place like the Duck River or some of these other unregulated tributaries, and if they have, their offspring have not been detected. I mean, it's hard to find larval fish, but it's, eventually they get to be two, three, four inches long. We have no problem finding those fish when they exist, as we saw in 2015. And we can do it tomorrow, well not tomorrow, but in the summertime on, on uh, Mississippi River, any time we want to go look for. So, okay. That's all I wanted to say. So I, just basically the, the movement that we've seen has not accelerated up the system. And when I think of these fish of moving, they're moving one population gets full, they spill to the next. That population gets full, they spill to the next. I don't think of them, and, and the data doesn't support, that these fish have a need to just mad run up the river, like a returning salmon or something. It, is, it seems like there's a population need, like they're getting crowded, they're not getting what they want, and there's more tendency to move to the next pool. Mr. Okay. Fisk, what, what do you think the population on Kentucky Lake is at now? I mean, do you think it's increasing? I know you said you haven't had any reports of the smaller fish, and I haven't spoken to any of the cruel clerks or anybody about this, but um, just from the reports that I get and from what I see, either bow fishing at night or side scans or things like that, and the commercial fishermen seem to be having what, what commercial fishermen we do have uh, fishing for the Asian carp seem to be having tremendous success success so what in your opinion on Kentucky Lake do you think is it are we going up or down or it's about to stay in the same I, I really can't answer that with data we we're, we were, we're only two two three years into a process where we can learn to measure a number each year one to the next to answer exactly that question and that's why we do monitoring that's why we need to develop them monitoring skills so I, but remember every day there's the, those locks that Kentucky and Barkley open and close on a typical year about 6,000 times. So there's all kinds of opportunity for fish to swim <clears> in. <throat> Immigration is a big part of the abundance that we see in these systems, unlike other lakes where we always assume that there's no fish coming or going because they generally don't. But you're talking about bass population, for example. So we, we want to be able to answer exactly those questions. All right, so nationally and in Tennessee, the, the goal is to stop the movement of Asian carp to new locations and reduce the abundance of carp in populated waters. Obviously, we don't want them where we don't have them, and if we can reduce their number by a meaningful amount, we would let, expect less impacts on those lakes that are affected by carp. So it's a, and it also reduces that likelihood of, of the movement upstream. So the strategies that we have identified that we need to address are prohibiting movement by people. There's still opportunity for that. We're removing, strategically removing carp. We're not paying to have people take carp out of the Mississippi River. We want them to take it out of the Kentucky and Barkley Lakes where it has more meaning for, our, for all our strategies. Uh, we, we need to install barriers or deterrents to stop and reduce upstream movement. Uh, that is kind of where we're at with the with our response right now. It's taken a while to get the funding and the know-how, and there's still some science to be learned about these deterrents as we talk about this. But we're also uh, monitoring abundance movements to answer important questions like, is what we're doing have, making a difference? And so I'll just hit this real quick. We've got a lot of laws on the books to prohibit movement of Asian carp. We're ready to respond with more if we have to, but we feel like we have this under control. It's illegal to stock any fish in Tennessee into public waters. It's illegal to move carp away from waters where we suspect you could have a small carp and accidentally stock them, which you shouldn't, you can't legally do anyway. So we've got that covered up. I don't think we have anything more legal that we need to do. We alert the public where, when they're in waters that have them so that they're aware and they don't do that. The, one of the important aspects, or important strategies that we've been working on has been the removal of carp. This is a, a carp fisherman on Kentucky Lake. Uh, he's, had, he's been one of the mainstay fishermen. Uh, we, we are paying to have Asian carp removed from Kentucky and Barkley Lakes. And actually, if they pull fish from Cheatham and Old Hickory, we'll pay for those too. But the, the population is so low, nobody wants to fish for them because there's, they're not going to catch any fish. So that's where we're, uh, we're, we're putting that effort and if we, 
If needed to, we could expand to Pickwick, but I'm not getting the sense that we have interest in that. And all the processors, the people that buy these fish off the water, are clear up in here and in Kentucky. So that's, that's where, where we're doing it. We're doing it by give, through our HIP program that gives them fund, gives the, the buyer a rebate for every pound of fish that they buy. So that it kind of beefs up that, that distributor processor person to where they can start a business and, and the commercial fishermen are getting paid well to do it. That's why we've been able to convert people that were fishing for catfish and paddlefish into full-time carp fishermen as long as the market is there to keep the demand for fish. So since we started this program in, in, uh, in Tennessee, we had, you know, we've removed 5 million pounds through the program. The state of Kentucky has similar, well, different, but similar intentioned incentive programs, and they've removed over 13 million pounds out of the same two lakes. So that's 18 million pounds out of uh, over almost two, little over two, it is two-year period there. Uh, I don't know how many pounds are in Kentucky Lake or in Barkley together. We, we did a little bit of, you know, crude modeling and came up at like 27 million pounds standing crop out there. You know, did, did we get half of them with this? I don't know. I'd, I'd rather have those other data reporting back with some precision to tell us if, if the population is changing. We certainly did meet our, our goal of getting people to remove Asian carp. Hey, uh, Frank, I, did, yep. I do have a question. I mean, and I, I'm really thinking about like, uh, you know, feral hogs, uh, beaver, bounty type scenarios. I mean, you know, down the road, what happens whenever the commercial fishery is depleted? I mean, do we have commercial fishermen trying to restock Asian carp? I mean, uh, I, that may be a question for two years down the road. I, you're five years, I, I don't know, but I'm just, I'm curious about, about those incentives. Yeah, that's something that we thought of two, four years ago, we've been worried about that. And it, we, we understand that, I don't, I don't think it'd be that easy to establish a population with just a few fish. I, that's why I want to talk later about where deterrents need to be. You don't need to just make sure, I, I don't want to see any fish stocked anywhere, but I, the risk of that seems low and, and the market and, and the and the wholesale dealers can shift because there's always going to be carp in the Mississippi River. And that's part of you know what's next for this industry and, and what we're thinking about in here is how do we make this how do we position what we're doing so that we can shift to that other resource and mm -hmm. and have the people investing along the way comfortable that that's there for them. And, but you're right. It, we, right now, this is the only game in town for removing fish, and, and as you'll, I, I feel that it's buying us time, as we've been waiting for the technology for deterrence and money for deterrence. And it's been a long wait, but we're getting there. So, uh, the expected outcomes of the strategic removal is to remove the impacts on the lake where the fish are removed from. I would like to think that every fish that uh, the fish that are coming out of Kentucky and Barkley Lake helps. Kentucky and Barkley Lake, I, mean, I realize we also have to reach some kind of tipping point. We can't just take a few out and expect benefits. That's why I want the industry to ramp up even more to the point where they're having a hard time catching fish. And, and more importantly, taking fish out of one lake re reduces the likelihood of these carp spilling over into that next reservoir. That's the, that's the invasion theory that we're working on. So what, what have we done as TWRA? We've, we've provided to date about 600,000 over the last few years of state dollars to commercial fishermen for that HIP program. We got a donation one year of 51,000 from TVA, thank you. Uh, and we now have a new funding source of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They've agreed to, to allow us to use their funding for contract fishing. And since these, this system is set up through contracts, it's contract fishing. So we've got that allowed for the first time this year. So that'll take pressure off state dollars and use these federal dollars. We also issued grants directly to uh, Benton County and Paris Henry County Industrial so that they could figure out what are the best ways to spend the money in their counties to get the businesses that need it up on their feet and increase their capacity. So we, we have a small grant in 2018 and we, the, our, our commission approved 400,000 and those grants went out the door in October or just a couple months ago. So they're actively spending those, those grants right now, on those grants right now. So I'll be really eager to see 
that they need space to hold fish so that they can compete and, and, and provide the services they have to in these bigger markets that want to show up and take a whole tractor trail or fish away every time they show up. And that's what they're, they're headed towards. So one thing. Hey, Mike. Yes. Hey, Mike. I heard Mike didn't get to your phone. Very well. Great. You, were, you came in a little loud. We're turning you down. But yes. Yes, sir. Okay, great. Hey, Frank, do we have, uh, how many local wholesale fish dealers do we have in Tennessee? We have three that are working on Asian carp in our program. We may have uh, maybe, I, I don't know the exact, like a handful more that are, that are actual wholesale fish dealers, maybe a dozen more, but they're not all. There's only three working in Asian carp. Okay. Do we have any more interested that would, that would be interested in Asian carp that you know of? No, when we when we put out our grant request, we we shared that information with surround like lakes counties surrounding the lakes, and we didn't hear anything. Okay. I think if, well, it, it, not not this time. Maybe with the right incentive, there would be, but not not with what we were offering. And Frank, let me just interject quickly. Bob, welcome welcome to the meeting. When we first uh, tried to introduce you, we. Well, at least we couldn't hear you. I don't know if you could hear us, but again, for the benefit of the public, this is Bob DC with TVA. And, and in fact, I probably should have started out with this. If, uh, if somebody does have a question, if they'd first say who they are and who they're with, that's something that just, again, not for the benefit of us, but benefit of anybody from the public who would be watching today. Uh, let's just say, announce who we are and who we're with before we ask the question. Thank you. Thanks. So this last bullet here is just a reminder to this commission that w we really need help to figure out how to increase demand for CARP. Uh, we'd like to not have to use incentives forever and build this to a, a, a booming industry that supports a lot of jobs and uh, take care of itself. So we have hinted a little bit about deterrence and barriers and this is you know, we're removing fish. The only other thing we can do is stop them from swimming upstream. All the labeled dams, which the dams are these little black things on the, on the screen here. Any of them that are labeled have locks. So that means the fish can swim through them. They can come all the way up to here, but they, they would stop up here at, what's that, Norris. They couldn't get into Norris. They couldn't get into Cherokee or Douglas, but they can get into, they can get into Loudoun. And we wanna, we wanna stop fish from swimming all, all the way up through here and the, the, the deterrent uh, there's a lot of deterrent methods available, and uh, I'm going to go through them now. But just remember, that's how fish are moving. They're going through locks. We, we've done the research to, to prove that we've tagged hundreds of carps. We've, carp, we've watched them with our passive receivers go upstream through locks, downstream through gates. They don't all go upstream. Some go back downstream different times of the year. They don't have the, the net movement, again, isn't this mad rush upstream. They're... Um, so we've demonstrated that lock is where lock is where we need to be working. So what are deterrents to moving upstream through locks? Well, you can close the lock permanently. That's not a very viable option on some of these heavily used navigation channels for industry and recreation. But there are places in the country where the locks were not used a lot and it was thought to be the benefit of overall society to close the lock and not use it. Uh, we, I don't, there's some locks in the Tennessee Cumberland system that are used less than others, but uh, that, that is one option. Uh, Cordell Hull and Melton Hill will be two that aren't used very much, but uh, the, the fact that they're not used very much suggests that the fish aren't going to get to use them too. So they're kind of in effect a barrier on, as they're operated right now. The, an, another system that's used is acoustic or sound. This is just loudspeakers underwater affixed to the, either the approach channels of the locks or the gate itself and and we're fortunate in that carp species are very sensitive to sound I believe that's why they're jumping uh, other spe not all species are going to respond to this sound so we can have some native fish that won't be affected and will move through while the carp don't move through and a lot of this work has been done in uh, laboratory or pond studies, but they've not been done in these, uh, not a lot of work has been done in locks such as we have on Tennessee system. So that's why it's important that we do this kind of research. Uh, one of the research projects that's ongoing now is the bioacoustic fish fence at Barkley. You may have heard of it, the bath. It uses sound bubbles and strobe lights to deter fish. I'll talk more about it in a minute. 
Carbon dioxide is another way that we can stop, we can chase fish out of a lock chamber before a boat comes in. And electricity, an electric grid in front of, this, of the lock would deter a lot of the fish from going in there. And lastly, it's not a direct deterrent, but I just want to remind everybody that removing fish below the lock helps our, our probability of fish not going through. It's a numbers game at some point. So here's a, an image of the bioacoustic fish fence being installed below Barkley Lock. This thing sits on the bottom so it does not impede navigation at all. Uh, this, this upper left corner here is just that concrete thing that's setting in a channel that they pre-drilled to, to receive that. And that's where all the equipment is housed so that it doesn't get clipped off by a barge going through. And it was, uh, there's an image of it, it was installed in November of 2019 and then it got uh, it was, we had fish tagged and then it got struck by lightning a couple times. Then COVID hit, the people didn't know how to fix it, live in the UK, they couldn't get here. Everything got postponed. Now we've got the, the, the state of Kentucky and their partners that are working on this evaluation are, have got more fish tagged ready to, be, to test the system and they're eager to see, it's, the system is operating and they're eager to see how fish use it or don't use it come this spring when movement of fish increases. In the, cold, in the cold weather, the fish don't move nearly as much as the spring and summer. So we'll be eager to see how this test plays out. If it's a highly efficient barrier, that would be great news. If it's not, we may have to look into other methods or improve that method. I mentioned carbon dioxide. This is where you bring in liquid carbon dioxide and mix it into water into the, in the lock chamber to a concentration where the fish hate it and they got to get out of there. It doesn't kill them, but they, they can't stay there. So they will actively swim away from this. You keep it on and keep that concentration going while the barge comes in. There shouldn't be any fish in there. Then you close the gate behind the barge and you go upstream. So that this is expensive. It's all, none of it's cheap from a fisheries biologist's point of view, but the acoustic is the cheapest method we're talking maybe a couple million to put one of them. The bioacoustic fish fence was at seven million, was what's in it, Barkley at least. That's just installation. The carbon dioxide, we're getting estimates, you know, we're talking, I don't know, it's in the report, maybe five million to install the structure uh, and all the piping. But this, on the right here, you could have the pipes diffusing the, ox the CO2 on the bottom or the sides of the channel. But you gotta do that every time a, a vessel comes through. And that, I did the math on what it would cost at the cost of CO2, and it's about 500 bucks a throw every time a boat goes through, every time they cycle that lock. So it'd be multiple millions of dollars to operate on, say, a, a lower river lock. Uh, on a lock that's not used very much, it, it, it could be pretty cost effective. So. And maybe some of you have heard of electric barriers, the, most famous one is on the Chicago area waterway system, and it is four electric barriers in a row. They, they don't trust just one because the barriers don't work 100%. They have, and they, they have the juice cranked up really high to reach down to, to get fish that could be as small as, I think they have it set for like three inch fish. It's incredible power demand to put enough power in the water to stop a small fish. Big fish get affected easily, but small fish don't. So they have to add more power to it. And their operating costs are like 10 million a year to run that thing. And it's, it's huge. I mean, this, I think this image here is actually a electric, I forget what they call it, like some kind of a sink where they, they got so much juice in this channel that they have to have a, 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 a reservoir to like suck the juice away so it doesn't go clear down the river. And it, it damages other things. All the barges that go through here have to be connected by steel cable or else they arc bad stuff happens. So it, it's been really interesting to learn about this and it, it is something that could be installed at a, at a TVA, TVA uh, lock. It, 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 the technology is there but it, it is generally expensive. It's not as safe for navigation. We would need a Coast Guard uh, safety plan associated with it and it doesn't work well on small fish. So for example, it wouldn't be very useful at all at Kentucky or Barkley where we know we have young reproducing fish in the Ohio Mississippi River. They would, just, they would come in at a regular rate but even with this thing on. And all, all of these methods would primarily be 
non-lethal for fish. Now, I don't know, uh, we, there, there'd be testing to be done. We would want to know how native fish would, re, would respond to these, these types of uh, deterrents as well, and that would be part of the research project that would have to go on with this. So what, again, this is the next thing that is the most logical next step in controlling carp. The progress that we've had to date on barriers or deterrents, we've had no funding available for barriers until the test barrier at Barclay in 2019. So criticize all you want for not putting one in by now, but we haven't had any money to do it. That's kind of, it's, it's been a really important conversation to have with all, everybody to just get the money there to do the work. And I hope, hope we're getting closer to that. Um, and so, and there's no funding. Well, uh, the word of bill passed today, so there may be funding in the near future. Do uh, Mike Butler want to mention anything about that? <laughs> he he is going to give an update and shortly. Okay, okay uh, good. Okay, about well, that. Yes. Until today, no no funding on sufficient scale. The most important thing that happened this year was that TVA initiated their programmatic environment, environmental assessment with an aggressive deadline. They are ready to go, and they're, they're really pushing all the partners to help them get the information they need. They've done a great job getting it going. This, this document will, when it's completed, the process is completed, will allow TVA to have the, the template there, if you will, to, to take the, the best recommendation and, and, and and evaluate it and, and have a finding on it. And then if we change our mind because fish move or funding changes or something, we, ha we, we can go back and amend it and not have to start a long process again. So this is really great, uh, great that TVA has set this up. Of course, this only affects the Tennessee Valley, but it, it's really important thing that happened in 2020. And in response to that, uh, a group that I work with is uh, all the states in the Tennessee Valley, the USGS, which is the research arm of the federal government, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is the federal wildlife you know, authority, and, and Tennessee Tech and some other universities too, you know, have all gotten together t in a structured decision process to evaluate where should we put deterrence and what kind of deterrence would we put at that spot given X amount of money or X given the conditions of the fish on the ground right now, and also considering a lot of factors like what if fish move more than they are now? What if the barriers aren't as good as we think they're going to be? What if fishing pressure by commercial fishing isn't adequate? Just looks at all these, it's a model, you know, it's, it, but it, the, the results tend to trend, point you in one direction of where you should put deterrence and the restrictions of the uh, and, and the limitations of the deterrent types are, are woven into it too. So that's not done. That's in my inbox, and that's something that I have to get out to that to, to TVA in this month. So, but th this is it's been a great experience working with that, those agencies, and we are we will have recommendations. Um, and all the while, the downstream removal efforts continue, which reduces the upstream pressure to buy time. And I want to go back to that electric barrier in, in Chicago where they've put $100 million to put it in place to date, $10 million a year to run it. And they still have an aggressive program to remove fish downstream of it just in case one would get near it because they don't trust it. They can't trust it. So this removal is an important part. You've got to get your, your number low so that, that the probability is low that they get through. It's a, it's, a, it's a math probability game all the way up the river. How many fish are there? What's the likelihood they're going to get through? What's the likelihood they're going to get through the next one? So you lower those numbers, we have fewer fish moving. I'm close, guys. This is a lot. Um, so I just want to go over some things about deterrence. No single system will be 100% effective, but they can be close if, we're, if they're designed right. I think it'll take time to tweak them to get to really good effectiveness. Multiple deterrents may be needed in one spot to compound the effect. If you got 80% with one and 80% with another, that's 96% effectiveness. So that's something that we're considering. Uh, what are the impacts to native fish and mussels? We have to consider that, and that EA process will do that. How many can we afford to install? What types? I mean, there's some practical reality here. We can't come out with a recommendation and just put one everywhere. We know there's only a limited amount of money. You know, what, what efficiency should we build for? It could be very expensive to build one 
that's near 99% effective, where it could be a lot cheaper to build one that's 80% effective. And if the modeling suggests that it's okay to have a little bit of fish get through, because maybe there's not reproductive potential upstream or something, then maybe that's okay. We gotta, we're considering that as well. Um, all these decisions are based on population dynamics, movement rates, uh, deterrent efficiencies, cost, and other public objectives like navigation and safety. And uh, all that stuff will be addressed in the, in the EA. Uh, the questions that we're asking ourselves in that group is where should these deterrents be installed? Again, I'm working with subject matter experts, people that have built CO2 chambers and chased fish out of them, people that have evaluated acoustic systems. And then management authorities, people like myself that don't have the research experience but are dealing with the fish on the ground in other states. And we, at this point, we, we recognize the need for barriers at locks upstream of the abundant populations, but we don't wanna to go too far upstream where we forego an opportunity to save uh, lower reservoir lakes. And we definitely need to stop the immigration from the lower, from the Ohio River at, at Kentucky, and hopefully the Barkley barrier will continue to work or work and be able, we'll be able to continue it because it's only a three year authorization right now. So where are we at? I guess it's pretty, pretty broad until, I, until we prepare the notes that we have got together, but just some combination of barriers in the upper, this will be the upper river options. Generally speaking, we're looking in this left side of the boomerang here for an upstream deterrent system, maybe one or two barriers. And then for a downstream point of view, we need one at Kentucky. And if we can't get one there, we may need to put one at Pickwick just to have, because you know, if there's some constraint at Kentucky where it's just not working, we may need to, so Pickwick has kind of a double value in that it would be a secondary downstream barrier and an early upstream barrier. So, but we, again, we haven't made a decision and that EA has not been written to declaring the preferred alternatives yet. And I just want to give a shout out to the, all of our staff that are doing the monitoring and research. A lot of people don't understand why we got to just go look at them. We should be doing something about it, but it's really important to understand where the fish are, you know, are there young fish in the population that can inform where we need to put barriers what are the growth rates, mortality rates? That could affect, that, that could tell us whether or not our fishing pressure is working or not. And we're always looking for reproducing fish. You know, are we removing enough fish? Where should we use lock, the, put barriers? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of questions like this, we can only have gotten to where we are because we did this kind of monitoring research, not only in Tennessee, but we're working off the, off the previous work of other states like you know, Illinois, Kentucky, and, and other uh, Mississippi River states. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions. I, I didn't, uh, and I'll, there's a question or two. Chairman Bell, I've got a question, it's okay. Frank, uh, living on Kentucky Lake, and I know Monty as well, um, we get questioned all the time. So, so has Asian carp had a detrimental effect on the sport fish in Kentucky and Barkley Lake? It, it has because fishermen don't want to fish with Asian carp. Uh, I think that the first species of impacted were people in, in a lot of ways. People, but the fish themselves are, we're, we're seeing crappie uh, numbers are pretty good on Kentucky Lake. We've got, year, we've got young crappie that are out there that are available to catch. Uh, the bass population on Kentucky Lake was extremely good uh, above 20 year averages. It, kind of around while we still had them in the early 2010s. But those year class, th those, that cohort of fish aged out and now we're kind of missing what's behind there, but we're still have, we still have bass there. I guess what I'm saying is when we look at the, our 20 year trends, and that includes times when we didn't have carp, we're still no worse than we've been in the past. So it's really hard to point to carp as every time we have a problem Whatever caused those problems 20 years ago could still be affected, it probably is still affecting the lake today. Now, whether or not having carp there is compounding that, that's a difficult question to tease out with, you know, again, three years of data that we have of being able to uh, reliably catch carp in a way where we can 
talk about their relative abundance. That, that, that's the goal is to be, have a reliable system to measure the abundance of Asian carp in these systems from one year to the next and then look at trends of our sports, sport species. It'll be interesting to see how many people fished and how successful they were in 2020. I know fishing, we measure fishing uh, activity on those lakes. And it was down. There's no, there's no getting around that. And, but I'll be curious to see if 2020, with people out uh, during the COVID break, so to speak, were, were, were successful, because I know they fished. Uh, One more question. And I know this is important to Chairman Bell and Dennis and others that live in the eastern part of the state. What can we expect from our neighbors down south, um, Alabama? Because that has, a, if you want to say, a bigger effect on what we do at Pickwick. Um, on them is, is that, that those states underneath us follow suit before the water comes back up. So, so what, what can we expect from those states? Are they, are they following suit with us? Are they as concerned? Because, um, you know, I noticed they only, seems like we're more sampling more, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, and, and, and the reason we are able to do, have been able to do more is we got funding sooner. We started getting funding we did some sampling before we got ex external funding, but it really helps get the external funding. They only got external funding for this. This was their first year using external funding because we were we communicated more with our partners and got to the money maybe sooner because we had a plan and we were, we were already in it. You know, you could make the same argument in Kentucky. You know, we, we, we lagged behind Kentucky. They had a lot more going on before we did. Alabama is in the same boat, but they are engaged in every one of the calls that we have about deterrent placement. They, have, they are buying all the same gear that we're buying so that they can have similar data that they can share with us. And our, our staff, Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee, we're working on the river today on Asian carp. So there's a partnership there where we're working together to get everybody on board. And it, it's, in, you know, especially with federal dollars, you know, it, it's got to be a multi-state effort to be uh, I mean, it just should be. It has to be to be successful. So. Dennis, I'll jump in. Dennis Tumlin uh, with Tourist Development. Frank, you mentioned a, a moderate population on Pickwick. It, 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 are there any commercial fishermen uh, fishing Pickwick actively now, or is the population too low? They're not in our HIP program, and they, 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 they could. I don't think they are. I, I, I'd have to ask my commercial fishing coordinator, but if there was any, I want to say no, but I, I don't want to verify that. I'm sorry. It, the, the numbers were too low a couple years ago. There was some interest in it. Some, it, it what, what we really need is, are tools for the commercial fishermen to use to exploit a low-density population, like some way to chase them into an area where they can get at them and not have to search the whole lake for a lesser number of fish. And there's some research going on with uh, USGS just, just about that, that modified unified method where they, that's that picture right there. You see that, that, uh, that block net going across this whole cove. They, they, they corral fish all day long, days long to get them all into one spot. So stuff like that could be effective in a pickwick, but, but <coughs> you don't, you know, there's a lot of commercial fishermen in Savannah. We haven't had any ask us to join a chip and, and set up a, a whole, no wholesale fish dealers have stepped out and talked to my commercial fishing coordinator. That was my next question, was really about the supply chain, um, the existing supply chain to make it cost effective. You know, if you're getting paid the same in Kentucky Lake to haul them to a fish processor from Pickwick, you, you're gonna have to pay more to get those fish moved and, you know. That, that's very likely, yeah. The further away we get from a processor, we would expect a higher incentive. Gotcha, look forward to looking at that, yeah. thank you. Chairman uh, Monty Blue, what what is the closest processor to Henry County? I, I know we've got one locally there. Uh, it's on Shady Grove Road. I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, we've got. Uh, we've, uh, it's Mr. Lensman. Yeah, we've got. Um, we've got. We've got Hearts Fish Market is right. one of our HIP and North American Caviar. North American Caviar. That's the one I was talking about. Hearts but and they're North both in, in Henry County. And right. There's one in Benton County. D D and D Caviar. And, and what are they doing with their fish? Because I, I've seen I've seen and heard, uh, I, I've eaten uh, to the board. I, I, I've had Asian carp uh, several times, and, it, and it's, it's actually really good-tasting fish. Uh, you know, I know at one time growing up, 
uh, in Henry County, if you'd ask somebody if you want some carp, Asian carp, you know, nobody's going to eat carp. Nobody. But if I think at one time TWA had an idea of branding it called, I think I heard it called Silverfin at one time. Uh, would you like some Silverfin? Uh, that sounds great. Maybe, <laughs> you know, and it tastes good. But um, what are some of the things that these companies are doing? I know at one time they were trying to produce some, some uh, a product where it could be served in schools, as fish patties, it could be all these different things, and, and trying to develop a need for it. Um, where are they at with that? And where, where do the, those hearts and North American caviar, where do those fish go from there? So, so yeah, they at, at times they will process those fish for human consumption, like head and gut for certain markets. They can they have a fillet market that's small, but they, that could grow easily. The the a lot of the fish in the last couple years that they caught would actually be sent to a processor in Kentucky. That's why they were needing uh, you know they had to make that haul with those fish. That's why they needed more more money to, to, to do it. But there and then it, and then that processor would would use them for human food or but or other things but i they have i haven't been it given a whole list of how the kentucky processor has handled i just know what our people have done the the really interesting market that it, it has doubled what they've been able to sell has been the bait market for lobster and to lesser degree crab that it takes i had a I had a lobster uh, entrepreneur or whatever, a captain of industry, come visit me in, in Tennessee here out of, out of Maine, and he explained to me it takes a pound of bait to catch a pound of lobster. And they do something like 250 million pounds of lobster a year, and they don't have, their bait source is limited. It's overfished, menhaden population. So they were eager to take Tennessee carp, and there was no processing involved. All they had to do was freeze it and send it. So that was a really good way to sell this meat, and they got a good price for it. Now, lately, I've heard that they've got to actually cut it up and shove it in boxes, so they have that little box that they can shove in the trap. But you know, there's a little processing there, and there, that is a big part of what some of the expansion money is going to go towards to be able to have the ability to hold enough carp to make it worthwhile to drive from Maine and get a bunch and go back. So that that and the the demand for fish. Is, has never been in question. It's just a question of the ability of the, these middle processors to get the right amount of investment at the right risk level to, to go for it and, and sell it. I mean, right. Some of the, some of the money that they're getting now is, is going to go into fish cakes at one of the markets, I hope. So. Right. Well, thank you. You know, I'd just like to tell the board, I, I grew up on Kentucky Lake, um, and uh, I've worked for TWRA as a boating officer out there for four or five years back when I was a trooper, and uh, uh, it's, it's crazy to see the Asian carp come into our waters and on K Kentucky Lake, you know, the old, the old saying, I have fish jumping in my boat, you know. Uh, well, I've never been a great fisherman, but I can catch Asian carp because they jump in my boat. I've had it. I've had it. No telling how many times. Uh, bow fishing. Uh, I went out with my son-in-law and a good friend of mine, Rusty Farmer, last uh, summer. Bow fishing, and uh, I bet we had 15 or 20 literally jump into the boat when you're out there at, at night. I guess the the vibration of the generator and the, the you know I, I don't know what it is the lights. Uh, but uh, it's unbelievable the amount of Asian carp that, that we've seen over the years, over the last few years, uh, that have come into you know Kentucky Lake when we've never seen them hardly before, and then now they're just so abundant. Uh, when you can look at them on side scans and they are so you know plentiful, uh, it's just it, you know it's unbelievable. Um, again, I'm not a great fisherman, but I, I, I have through the the, uh, the coffee shop talks and all the local bass fishermen uh, i think it's really affected it seems it's like it has affected our bass fishing more than our crappie fishing uh i, I think it's affected both uh and i don't think asian carp is the sole uh thing that has affected our fishing i think it's a lot of factors uh fishing it whether it's water levels at certain times or fishing pressure or when we lost the grass mill full um, uh, technology, uh, you know, uh, I told somebody a few days ago, uh, when I started fishing when I was a young man, a, a depth finder and a paddle to my daddy was the same thing. 
uh, I can go fishing with somebody now and you can see your lure go to the bottom and come up and the fish take the lure in his mouth. Uh, you know, but I think there's a lot of different things to it, but I think Asian carp is a huge deterrent, uh, especially to Kentucky Lake and in, in the area that TWRA chairman and I are from. Any further questions for Frank? Uh, Frank, I've got, um, well, and before I ask you a question, did want to, uh, neglected when we started to recognize Bobby Wilson, director of TWRA. Thank you for uh, opening up this uh, conference center for us to meet. I know we are administratively attached to TWRA, this commission is, um, but still we appreciate you and your staff being here today to help us uh, make this meeting available to the public uh, to watch it. So appreciate you being here today and, and assistant director uh, Chris Richardson, wherever he walked out to as well. Oh, there you are, Chris. There you are, Chris. You need a haircut. You don't look the same as you did. <laughs> so, a um, couple quick questions before we before we go on um, to uh, to uh, allow a couple other people to make comments. Uh, you know, one of the things that I hear constantly in East Tennessee is close locks, close locks, close locks. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the impediments to closing locks. Why that's not why that may not be a practical thing to do, and and who actually has the authority to do that? Yeah, the, the authorization to for all the activities at those dams on the on on the rivers comes from Congress, and they have that authority to do that. That's not an authority that we have in the state. Okay. It uh, it would not seem it would not seem practical as a long-term solution for sure it, given the amount of commerce that moves through through locks that have you know when you get upstream into Nickajack area is one I'm kind of remembering off the top of my head was around 1500 cycles uh, a year and uh, you know I, I I wouldn't know where to begin to do the economic impact of all that right. all that compared to the economic impact and I think that would be an argument someone would have to make but Again, it's not authority that we have as a state to, to, to do. Okay. All right. Um, and then the next question that I was going to ask you, if you, and you did reference in some, talk a little bit about your interaction with and your communication and cooperation with adjoining state agencies uh, and, and what y'all may be doing. And then we're going to go to uh, Mike Butler and let him talk a little bit about uh, this group that I know you're part of as well that have these uh, <clears throat> these phone calls. I think Dennis, you've been part of that as well, and and what the feds are doing. But specifically, if you can speak to the cooperation that you're getting from the wildlife agencies in Mississippi, Alabama, Kentucky, and and any plans on I don't know uh, as a group coming together and and working on this. Yeah, we we actually have calls nearly biweekly in the last five months working on different both specifically this deterrent thing but yeah we are organized in a, at a lot of different levels at the most high arching one is through the Mississippi Interstate Cooperative Resource Association which is MICRA and we I am the Tennessee Cumberland uh, representative for all the states in those in that basin and I serve on that uh, executive committee so so I, I, I kind of lays on with, with that group and that that micro group is also the group that looks at all the projects that are coming through the how the the federal the US Fish and Wildlife Service relies on MICRA to comment on how the money gets spent that they have in their Asian carp fund. And so we do that we do that job for them. We review our our, our colleagues and we work together. We're we're learning if something's working in one state, others are quick to follow. We're also standardizing our gear so that we can talk apples to apples when we when we talk about what what we're doing. Uh, we we've used there have been lessons learned from other states as you can imagine a state like alabama that has not had a lot of experience on the water benefited greatly from tennessee and kentucky uh, but yeah we're working together as as a team because we you know the it's the valley-wide issue and it's a national problem it's not something that one state can just say yeah we're gonna we're gonna deal with this and uh last question is do you know is there any other um country in the world dealing with this same problem, uh, that not the Asian countries, but where it's a non-native species, and have they had any success? Is there, and not just have they had any success, the other states have been working on this a lot longer, Illinois, I guess Wisconsin, 
probably Michigan, <coughs> Ohio. Any successes you can point to? I, I would, I guess I would argue that the aggressive removal of carp from the system in Illinois in conjunction with barriers has been successful in removing, in keeping carp out of the Great Lakes, just in our own country. Okay. Uh, and, you know, it, it happens that this is a species that does not appear to be reproducing well in our rivers this year, knock on wood, or in, in they, they could someday, they get, I, but they've had 20 years to do it. Uh, and then maybe there's going to be a tipping point next year, and I'll regret ever saying that. But that's you know that that's the good news in this. There's other species that are coming from other from up north. They're the, the round goby, the little thing that the little uh, it's like a darter looking fish that is in the Great Lakes. They're probably going to come here, and when they come here, there's not going to be anything we can do about it. Nobody's going to harvest them. They're only this big. Hmm. You know, they're just going to be everywhere, and they're, they'll have their effect on the ecology of our system. So this. It's not that they're a good fish to have, but at least we have a commercial option with them, and we they're big enough to to deter. Or I mean, they they have that sensitivity to sound that we can manipulate, and we may not have that with other. If this was a bass species we were worried about, it was found wouldn't work. <laughs> so, I mean, there's other countries that have. I mean, I think of Australia and some of those island countries that are overwhelmed by invasive species have had a lot of a lot of failures. I'm sure because it's just hard. Okay. Uh, and maybe some successes, but I... All right. Any further questions for Frank? Seeing none, we appreciate appreciate the presentation. Sure thing. Uh, next, I want to go to Mike Butler. And Mike, just, uh, I know it's already been referenced, talk about your participation in this regional group and also give us an update on what's happened at the federal level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad to do that. Um, about October of 2018, Frank and I were talking and we, we started seeing that there was a lot of activity going on around Asian carp, him working through MICRA. Um, we were talking to partners, long and short of it was, we felt like more people needed to be on the same page talking about all these different efforts at the federal, state, and local levels. So we instituted a, uh, a meeting, a regional meeting, and started with Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Mississippi. That quickly grew. It's now about 35 different state agencies, federal agencies, almost all the members of Congress in that area uh, and U.S. Senators have staffers on those calls and that created momentum. And so that momentum that came out of that uh, landed us in the uh, FY20 federal budget where we saw the first fruits of our labors which was a $14 million markup um, on funding to combat CARP through the Department of Interior, primarily through the Fish and Wildlife Service. We hear that that is all, that is, we've been successful in getting that reinstituted in this year's FY21 budget. Depending on how Congress goes with a continuing resolution, it seems to be locked in with the appropriations bills or the CR. So we expect that money to keep coming. I think TWRA was able to pull 1.6 million of that, somewhere in that neighborhood, 1.7 million. And we wanna see more of that come as we have ways to spend it wisely that we can measure and show are effective. Um, the second piece that um, was really kind of um, important, and, and this is exciting to announce today, is I just got word that the uh, Water Resources Development Act came out of conference with a recommendation of $25 million to be used on barrier projects in the Tennessee and Cumberland River systems up to 10 projects. <clears throat> That is a uh, one-time $25 million. We could, We'll obviously try to get that renewed. Uh, that's a two-year. WERDA has passed on a two-year cycle. And so what that means is finally we have dollars to go towards barriers, it looks like. If the House passed it without objection under suspension of rules this afternoon. It'll go back to the Senate, but it's a formality. It's considered a formality over there. That is a huge that's great um, news. A huge move on, uh, to help us in the southeast. Most people here and know uh, the Great Lakes has been getting hundreds of millions of dollars to prevent these fish from getting into those rivers because of what we've seen happen on the Illinois River, for example, that's been completely devastated from these fish. Um, I think that uh, there was one other piece that we didn't anticipate we had talked about, but we didn't think it was going to happen, and it absolutely did. Part of the WERDA uh, Act put in a new program with the Fish and Wildlife Service called the Asian Car Fish and Wildlife Service Asian Carp Eradication Program, which is $4 million in additional dollars each year from 21 to 25. So that's an additional uh, 16 to $20 million that's going to be available to the service to help 
on some of that. So now we're finally starting to see the resources come into play where we can actually get after this. And Frank's, his team has been doing a great job, agency keeping these fish at bay through HIP. Uh, the commission stepped up and uh, put in a million dollars for those grants that you've heard about. Those are all incredibly important things that are going on. The last thing I'll mention that I think is going to be very important is we figured out the way that the Great Lakes have been able to secure the funding that they have has because they, they created something called the Great Lakes Fisheries Commission. And there's a couple of different commissions like that. And these federal commissions are, are scattered throughout the country. Um, it is our intent to work with our partners in Mississippi to introduce federal legislation to create a Mississippi River Basin Fisheries Commission. The, the, the genius of that idea, which is really supported in large part by MICRA, the group that uh, Frank has mentioned that he's on the executive committee of, we will be able to have direct appropriations go to that group. What that does is it makes it more efficient to get those dollars on the water because you don't have everybody taking their bite out of that pie as it moves through this federal system. That group uh, will be regionally based board people, the board, the governing board will be made up of fisheries professionals. But our hope is that we'll be able to direct those funding resources to that group to implement around especially programs like HIP and others as they come online and get a le different level of efficiency in terms of the dollars on the water making an impact. Mike, is there anything we could do as a, an advisory commission to help aid uh, that, that, that goal to create this federal commission? I think, yes, I do. I think there's some things we can do out of the gate. One, I think we can uh, thank our congressional delegation. They've done a fantastic job. Congressman Kustoff has been a great leader on this in West Tennessee. Congressman uh, Burchett has stepped up to the plate and been helpful. Uh, Congressman Fleischman has been helpful. Uh, Senator Alexander has been a stalwart. It, if it wasn't for he and his staff, um, we, would be, we wouldn't be where we are today, especially on WERDA. They really played a, a fundamental role. But so I would say have, sending, we'll have to get Senator Haggerty in up to speed on this. So we're, you're working we are, on that, I'm We sure. have started doing that, <laughs> okay. and I, I do want to say I'm not leaving out any other members because they didn't help. I'm just pointing out the folks that did actively put a leadership piece on the ground. Um, I would say this. Uh, when this bill drops in Congress, getting behind that bill for the Basin Fishery Commission is going to be very important. So... That would be the other piece. Supporting, and Congressman Cooper and Cohen have been very supportive as well of the funding that we've been getting. I, I failed to mention them. I think continuing to support them in support of funding that we've gotten in place now for both catching fish and for putting in barriers is going to be key, and support for the Basin Fishery Commission concept is going to be key. Okay. Well, uh, Mike, just keep us up to date on um, when... Uh, we could act as a body, you know, I can get, to, we can draft a letter uh, as a body and, and send it to our congressman in support of this uh, legislation. Just let us know, when, and to thank them, let us know when would be the best time to do that. Be glad to. All right. Thank you. Next, I want to hear from uh, Chris. Well, Chris, I uh, think you've, we've already covered that. Oh, we were going to ask, I was going to ask you to have Frank tell us about what the surrounding agencies are doing. We've already covered that. Next, I want to go to Dennis Tumlin. And Dennis, you and I had a discussion um, unknown to me. There, there has been a group in Tennessee met before, a little bit different than this, but somewhat similar goals, and talked about uh, a couple of things that, could, that would be helpful to do. And I want to turn it over to you to uh, talk about uh, what, what you see, one, one of the things that would be beneficial for us to ask to have done as a, as a commission. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Funny that Mike mentioned late 2018, there was a kind of a grassroots uh, stakeholder committee meeting. Uh, I don't even know if you'd call it a committee. Frank, you may have been there, but we were over in Andy Holt. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Cordell Hall building. Andy Holt was there, um, maybe two dozen folks, Charlie Ingram from West Tennessee. A lot of folks know Charlie. Um, I'm gonna call it stakeholders. And we all got in a room and, and um, I was former director of economic development and tourism uh, in East Tennessee in a, a town called Ray, uh, Ray County, Dayton, using Lake Chickamauga to drive economic activity. And so I was there as a stakeholder and we had this informal uh, unofficial group meeting to talk about this topic and how could we move the ball down the court and, and gain momentum. Um, coming out of that meeting, uh, I think I was the only person in the room that had an economic development uh, slash industrial focus. Most folks were fisheries or, or different backgrounds and 
uh, one of the items I was tasked with was to, to look into getting an economic impact statement performed that the legislators that were in the room said, uh, in order for me to appropriate funds, I would really like to see a cost benefit analysis from a business perspective. Uh, how do we get a cost benefit? Um, at that time, the Great Lakes Commission had, had done an economic impact statement for the, the uh, potential loss should the fish reach the Great Lakes. And they had put an $8 billion per year price tag on the potential loss to the seafood or the industry, uh, the local economy, if those fish reach the Great Lakes. So they were running around using that uh, $8 billion price tag to secure large federal appropriation. Um, coming out of that, uh, I immediately reached out to University of Tennessee um, to check their interest in performing an economic impact statement for us. I uh, got uh, introduced to William Fox, Bill Fox, with the uh, Boyd Center for Research and Analysis there at University of Tennessee. He gave us a proposal, this one's dated April 2019, for UT uh, had an interest in doing that statement for us. It was a six month process uh, for them to generate the statement uh, at a cost of around $130,000 for UT to, to generate that statement. But it would be a uh, looking at uh, tourism, the loss of property values, looking at potential job loss to the boating industry, uh, hotel motels, marinas. There's a whole food chain of people that can be impact impacted if this thing is left unchecked and I have the proposal. They would need to update it today should this commission want to pursue that. Uh, but there was some work done, Mr. Chairman. Dennis, and one of the, when Dennis told me about this, I had no idea that they had already had a proposal put out there um, to look at the economic impact study. And of course, y'all know we've heard from, uh, we've heard a lot of anecdotal um, examples of, you know, uh, loss of property values, loss of, um, income on bass fishing tournaments and and other losses loss of tourism dollars on, on Kentucky Kentucky Lake but I think it would be beneficial for this Commission to get dr. Fox to do a um, an economic impact study uh, I know I've already spoken to uh, Chris Richardson about about the possibility of doing this and and seeking some funding either from the state or from TWRA uh, to um, to look at at having Dr. Fox do an impact study, and I'm throwing that out as a, I don't know, for formal motion yet, but at least for discussion about what what the rest of the commission thinks about uh, about the idea of having Dr. Fox do this. So we have more than anecdotal evidence to say that this is hurting uh, Kentucky Lake or this is hurting Pickwick Lake and the potential harm that it was it's going to do in East Tennessee Lakes if not checked. So throwing that out for discussion for the commission. Do, Mr. Yeah, Chairman, you do, recognize. do we have a cost figure? Uh, Dennis? Yes, sir. The, uh, the cost uh, in April of 2019 was $130,175 was the cost. He was allocating two research members uh, plus himself uh, for a six-month project, and that was his cost that he was passing through. Okay. Can I ask Director yes. Wilson? Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, Director Wilson. If, if TWRA funded that, would that come out of license dollars? I guess would be my question. I know that's that's a, and I know right. to you guys, it, you understand that, but it, I, um, I, I'm, I, I'm wondering where the where the actual funds would come from if TWRA funded it versus if we could get the state. Director you know, Wilson, you want me to turn this over to Chris, or do you would you like to take this question? Well, I, I think I know the answer. Okay, if you know the answer, because Chris, that's and I all right. Let him answer. Let him answer. No, yes. I'm kidding. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> And if you would, I guess we need you at a microphone so not not so other people from the public can hear you. Sure, that's a good uh, yeah. point. Yeah, um, it probably would be licensed dollars because we're already matched out on our federal sport fish dollars that we could. I'm not sure if we could use that, but I believe we probably could use some. But we've already maxed out on it, so it would more than likely be 100% uh, licensed dollars uh, for that study. Chris, if you would please come to Mike. I'm sorry. Not to be contrary to Director Wilson, uh, but <laughs> Chairman Bell, as, as, as you were the sponsor of the legislation, you, you might be able to speak to it as well as anybody, yeah. but we were successful in getting a little additional funding out of the marine fuel tax, which the commitment that we made to the General Assembly was that that money that's collected on the water would be spent on the water. 
I think that we and this commission certainly with its backing could make the argument that that an expenditure such as this to do an economic study relative to Asian carp is an expenditure related to to the water certainly so that that it's something we could explore but it certainly is another source of of, of funds that may be eligible for this right. expenditure. And, and Chris remind me was that a was that I'm I've got 2.2 or I've got 4 million in my head which annual the 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 increase out of the improve act to the TWA was 2.2 new 2.2 million new dollars recurring okay so so what what we discussed was again our commitment that, that we made at that time was it would it, this is money that would be spent on the water so I envision it not being licensed dollars but I envision it being uh, part of this 2.2 million uh, annual money that we get from the fuel tax on fuel bought on the water. Again, part of the Improve Act was before that money was going to roads. And, you know, I, I tried to make the case, why, why is that money going to roads? It doesn't have anything to do with roads. And so we got it redirected to TWRA at that time. So that, that was my idea. Uh, and that if that's possible, and I don't know if that's something we, we run by the attorneys or, or, you know, or the commission, but, but that's what we were, that's what we were envisioning. Okay, <laughs> All right. that's 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 what we that's what we were envisioning coming out of that those dollars. Hey, any any further comments on this idea? Yes, uh, Chairman, I'd just like to say I think it would be a good expenditure, a good idea. I would like to talk to the uh, maybe the Benton County Chamber of Commerce in Henry County. Uh, I don't know if they've had any studies done or on the economic impact of of the local communities there as well but I, I do think this would be a good expenditure uh, especially if we can get it out of that that uh, new uh, gas tax there right yeah I, and I would I would I'll say where I think you were going I wouldn't want it as a license holder and payer each year I wouldn't want it coming out of the license that's right all right okay. all right Frank Thank you, Chairman. I just had a question about the scope. Would this include the Valley or just Tennessee? Because there's other partners potentially in Alabama. And we had that states. conversation. This proposal was the Tennessee portion. And I, we were in the conversation of being holistic and crossing state lines. So that was, but this proposal was literally Tennessee specific. And I think there was some uh, concern about them studying broader, but I think we can enlarge the scope and, and ask them what, whatever we wanted to. Just curious. Thank you. Yeah. One, one comment there, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you, sir. Um, we did some, we dug really deep trying to get, raise this 130. Um, and, and to Monty's point, we went out to some of the counties that had the Tennessee River Resort Act um, funding that, that they received. We received, we found willing participants out in West Tennessee along the Tennessee River to put a portion in to put um, from Tennessee River Resort Act was willing. Uh, we also had some conversation with the Appalachian Regional Commission folks, uh, Sammy's team that manages the ARC. They were a willing participant also for the portion of the study if we could allocate. They only wanted to fund East Tennessee 25%, um, but they were willing participants there. And then we kind of, um, so we got pretty deep and raised, had commitments on about half the money when the brakes got put on. And then there was a conversation about some type of committee like this. So, so the partners are out there willing to talk about helping fund. Okay. Any further comments on this? Mike, you recognize? Mr. Chairman, I would just, just say that I think it, having that information is going to be really important moving forward be, because while $25 million is a lot of money, it's not enough. And we're going to have to justify all these things. And, and we've been really looking at what happened in other states, not what has happened in Tennessee to justify getting this funding. And, and it's scary enough what's happened in other places to be able to, to get that going. But uh, to maintain this path we're on, we're going to need as much information as we can get our hands on. Well, and, and it can't help but benefit the goal uh, that that you have and, and the group has to uh, to to create this federal commission uh, and this regional commission um, and you know as you said to create the cleaner pipeline for us to get money and for those of y'all who don't know Dr. Fox is the most respected economist in the state of Tennessee he's the guy that does uh, uh, all the economic projections uh, Sammy if I remember right for, for the for the state for our budget uh, so uh, his reputation is uh, the best, and he's somebody that the federal partners that uh, that Mike 
is working with, when they see that name, they're going to recognize that and know that, this, that there's a lot of credibility behind whatever figure he came up with. Yep. You're right I do nice. have one, not a question, but just for clarification purposes, I don't know if you wouldn't want to take a vote or whatever, but from the Fish and Wildlife Commission standpoint, if we have a, mud, a meeting and need a budget expansion, are you directing, does this commission here feel like that that's where you want to go? Because we need to find out if we can use that money. If we can, we need to pass a budget okay. expansion. So that's, I don't know and, exactly what action. And, and I guess I'm going to, uh, uh, I guess we should take a vote. I'm kind of, I'm kind of feeling through this. I've never been part of an advisory commission. I know how committees work. I know how that procedure is supposed to go. And of course you do as well. Uh, but let's, let's go ahead and y'all, the proposal would be that, that uh, we enlist um, the University of Tennessee uh, to do an economic impact statement. Again, that's based on the information that, that, uh, that Dennis got back in 2018. And, uh, and Dennis, at some point, and I know we're administratively attached to TWRA, so Chris, I'm kind of looking to you as well. Maybe that's something you and Dennis, since he's had the, the, um, um, the um, experience already of, of getting this, maybe something y'all could work on together to contact Dr. Fox. Do you, do you know? Okay, Dennis can do that. Y'all contact Dr. Fox and, and work on another proposal. Uh, he may not have to do a lot with this one that's just two years old here. And, um, and let's, let's go ahead and take a vote on, on uh, asking the commission to, um, well, first asking, uh, you know, first we've got to get the proposal. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, uh, Dennis and Chris will work on getting the, the proposal. And when the proposal is in hand, let's ask the commission to uh, allocate money. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say out of the, um, out of the, the water, the fuel tax fund, uh, to, to, pay, to pay for this. And, and y'all will have the discussion on whether you think it's worth it and whether, whether you know, the, the, it, the cost is there. But let's go ahead and I'll make them, and I'm chairman, I can't make the motion. I'm looking for a motion, a motion. I'll, I'll to, make to that do, motion. Okay, it's been made and is there a second? It's a second by Mike Butler. So we have a motion and a second to, uh, to ask the commission to allocate money to pay for an economic impact study. Again, Dennis and Chris will work on getting that study from Dr. Fox. So we have a motion and a second. Any questions on the motion? Yep, Sammy, you recognized. Sammy Arnold, ECD. Um, just so making sure I understand, the, the primary way that we would use the analysis would be potentially to justify future state funding, you know, for, for whatever solutions we may come up with. State and, and federal funding. Federal. That's right. That's, that's what it is. And, and you, to, 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 uh, um, to, to justify the money, we've got to show that, there, that there's more than anecdotal evidence, even though I think the anecdotal evidence is overwhelming. To have an official study from Dr. Fox would, would add a lot of credibility to that. Okay. So that's what it is. Yeah. All right. Any further questions on the motion? Seeing none, without objection, we'll take a voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. Ayes have it. So the motion has passed. And I uh, appreciate Chris and Dennis uh, working on contacting Dr. Fox as well. That is all I had uh, for us today. Is there anything else? Well, we've got to produce a report, a report between now and February 21st, if I remember correctly. Uh, it's sometime in February. Um, I don't know. I haven't really even thought about possibly having another meeting, maybe sometime uh, late January, 1st first, first of uh, February. Uh, the, the only report we may be able to produce at that time is that we've had a meeting and, and basically uh, give a report on our first meeting and what we discussed and the action items that we took. Uh, and I, I will, um, I'll get together with um, uh, director and assistant director um, as well and see if, um, see if we might want to call another meeting late January, 1st February at that time. Yes, Commissioner? So uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember back to the uh, executive order. Yeah, I've got I, it right here in front of I think it was like, uh, uh, you know, wh whatever the date is that we were to meet and we were to have listened to the report and assess the effectiveness of right. whatever activities or, you know, have occurred and then uh, perhaps offer recommendations for going forward. So that certainly could be 
uh, well in line with what we're talking about uh, right. with the proposal with Dr. Fox. Yeah, um, item number nine on the executive order says the commission shall deliver an interim report to the governor on or before February 1st. So there's the date, February 1st. We've not got for two, less than two months to produce an interim report um, on the effectiveness of barriers. And of course, a lot of that's covered in the reports y'all have already given. And But then we can give an update to what happened at this meeting and that uh, we're looking to, to do an economic impact study. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Commissioner. Any further business for me, the members? Yes. More thing. I just want to take a minute to, to thank Governor Lee yes. um, for seeing the need for this advisory committee. Um, I would also like to call out the, the appointees that he, he chose to be on there. I think it was excellent. Um, the appointees that just both speakers chose to represent them have been excellent. Um, I just think it's a, it is a great advisory um, commissioner committee um, and I'm I'm excited about it um, I know Monty living living on Kentucky Lake I, I wish you guys would come down sometime um, and let us take you for a boat ride I think you would be amazed um, and the economic impact is is not only fishing but it's it's more of do I want to live on a lake where I'm going out on a pontoon boat and fish are jumping in or, or would I rather no, no offense to East Tennessee but or would I go to rather go up there where there is none yeah so there, I would rather be on a lake where there is none. But uh, anyway, I, I think it's important um, from statewide man economic impact to look at this as a statewide problem because that's what it is. Right. Um, it's not only just a West Tennessee problem. It's going to be an East Tennessee problem if we don't get it fixed. So right. just to thank Governor Lee for his willingness to help us. Okay. Mike, you recognized? Uh, one thing that I'd like to put out there for a future meeting we can discuss uh, in preparation later down the road is – opportunities that may exist with other state and federal agencies around uh, the economic development side of this. I know that the, I think those would be appropriate maybe to investigate after we get this report from UT maybe or in process parallel. Um, we we had some discussions with Sammy's department and, and there, there are a myriad of programs but there's been no cohesive effort to kind of bring everything together and say where can we draw from. Example, USDA, USDA Rural Development has some resources that we've been talking to them about. Um, it just seems to me that there would be a, uh, a need as well as TWRA has nailed down the biology and trying to, and nailed down the effectively the approach to deal with the problem from that end, a similar approach where we bring all the resources together in the room to have a discussion about a plan to address the, the market development and the economic development side of it, uh, maybe in a more uh, focused effort than we've done in the past all right any further comments seeing none and without objection we're adjourned